Okay. Yeah, just to start out with, um, I would like to introduce our center of excellence, Quantum Frontiers, uh, which is located in Lower Saxony in North Germany. That's where a number of institutions you should see down here have joined efforts uh, involving the two universities in Braunschweig and Hanover, two cities about 60 kilometers apart, together with the uh, Metrology Institute of Germany, PTB, which is also in uh, Braunschweig. We have the ZAM in Bremen, another 60 kilometers to the west, um, the Max Planck Institute for Gravitational Wave Physics in Hanover, and the LZH, which is a, well, center for laser development. So um, this is a cluster supported by the German Research Foundation to, to push some excellence in, in research. So what's, what's our joint effort? I mean, all these institutions deal with precise and accurate measurements. Um, that's kind of obvious on the Metrology uh, Institute side, but also the research institutes try to push the limits of, of measurement, quantum measurements, by entanglement, by squeezing, by developing novel quantum technologies, nano quantum things, etc. So that's why we decided to, to well, join uh, our efforts to collaborate and try to to push the foundations of metrology, but also the applications of metrology in different cases by merging quantum metrology, as I said, squeezing entanglement, etc., with nanometrological developments, especially in, in Braunschweig at the university, and then come to new possibilities. And a few examples, very coarse overview, because of course that's an enormous group of people, are these different uh, topics, say, uh, there is obviously with the Max Planck Institute uh, a, a strong point in gravitational wave detection where it comes to um, the use of non-classical light you know, to improve the readout noise in the interferometers, but also development of, of new mirror structures um, that provide less thermal noise and better detecti uh, detectability of, of um, um, these gravitational waves. There's a strong effort in fundamental physics, looking at potential variations of fundamental constants, searching for dark matter with tools like optical clocks, for example. Uh, we look at quantum objects and gravity, and, and maybe also the entanglement of many body um, quantum systems in the university, and make use of that for, for better methodological measurement. Applications uh, in metrology could be, and there we have a strong cooperation uh, with the um, Institute for Geodesy in Hanover, um, are, are quantum sensors in geodesy. And well, we will have a bunch of talks on atom interferometry uh, tomorrow, which would be one quantum optics tool for, for geodesy, but we are also using optical clocks for relativistic geodesy to measure potential differences by the gravitational redshifts. That's, for example, also something we are doing in our group. And um, there is the development of novel nano and quantum engineering devices like nano LEDs that can very precisely illuminate things with sub-wavelengths, resolution, etc. So these are examples of, of what we are doing in quantum frontiers to push the limits of metrology. Um, obviously, people want us to produce highlight papers, and well, we just flash a few here on different topics, no? um, in corporations on well, antimatter, on quantum gases in theory, on dissemination of optical frequencies uh, to other partners, um, on novel techniques of power stabilization, uh, with very strong PhD thesis at the Max Planck Institute, or uh, again on at atom interferometry. So no, there's a lot of research output going on by these joint efforts. But I think what's very interesting here is that we also have the capability to come up with novel research devices no, by these merging of efforts. We have a fiber link um, for frequency dissemination between PTB Braunschweig and the University in Hanover. And now the idea has come up to use this fiber link as well for quantum communication um, tests uh, and try to, to join these efforts of time and frequency dissemination with quantum communication uh, on, on that fiber. Or another thing is that we came up with no novel infrastructures like the QVLS, which stands for Quantum Valley Lower Saxony. Um, that's a little bit confusing, I have to admit, on my side, because there are two types of QVLS. There's one 
which is a society, so to speak, um, that has the, the purpose of promoting quantum technology in our region and having well, outreach, etc. cetera, uh, these political issues. But there's also a, a project, the Q1, which is a demonstrator for 50 qubit quantum computing um, device. So uh, these are efforts or projects that are attracted you know, by this quantum fr frontiers and there are many others allocated nowadays. So we have, I think, a very rich research environment um, there in the Braunschweig, Hanover, Bremen region, which is very interesting to, to join, to have a look at. And well, in terms of advertisements, if you're looking for positions as PH PhD or postdoc, I mean, there are so many gr groups cooperating and doing interesting things. There are usually some interesting positions free. So that's what I wanted to quickly tell you about our infrastructure and maybe probably due to the sponsorship of this conference um, about quantum frontiers. Any questions on that? Not, right? Um, so let's come to the topic I am more familiar with, to be honest, than the political talk, which is um, optical clocks uh, and well, with a focus on the black body radiation and what's happening with optical clocks there. Um, so I was asked, as many people here, uh, to, to give a little bit an introduction into the topic. Uh, so I want to tell you a few basic ideas on optical clocks in particular, but just bridging a little bit towards atomic clocks in general, um, and especially why optical clocks promise to be better, more accurate, more stable, whatever you like to call it, than the atomic clocks we will hear later about uh, by, by Eckhart Pike. And uh, there will be some important factors that we need for the optical clocks, which is trapping, for example. Um, then I want to focus on to black body radiation and uh, the, the need to look at its effect on the atomic clocks in terms of the accuracy. Um, that brings us to the point that we need two ingredients. It are the atomic parameters, how the atom reacts to the black body radiation, but also we have to know what the environmental field is, so the control of temperature and what we can do there will be the last topic of my talk here. All right, so um, how does such an optical clock work? Um, in principle, like any clock, you start out with a local oscillator, and in our case, that's a highly frequency stable laser. And we get the laser stability out of uh, a reference resonator. So we stabilize the laser to a cavity, Harvey Pro cavity, and transfer the length stability of that cavity um, to the laser frequency. We've heard about high finesse cavities, etc., uh, during the conference. Here, these cavities work with mirrors that produce, well, we start to be happy around 150,000 and two, 300, 400,000 finesse is something we are aiming for. And the fractional length stability of these things are supposed to be in the 10 to minus 16 range. Uh, so they have to be very well isolated from the environment. And actually also these things are subject to thermal noise by Brownian motions, and that's limiting the length stability of these things. Um, however, that's an artifact. No, it has arbitrary frequency, resonance frequency. So to make a clock out of that, we have to tie the frequency of that laser to an atomic reference. So we compare the laser frequency with an atomic resonance. We try to excite it at the uh, resonant frequency, and usually that does, doesn't match. So we are looking for a resonance feature here, well, are the excitation line, so to speak. And we um, interrogate the line not on resonance, but we detune by a defined way right and left of the resonance and uh, look at the excitation probability of these points. And as long as the experimental conditions do not change rapidly, meaning the laser quality or um, the atom number or excitation probability of uh, laser intensity, you know, we, by this way, get rid of fluctuations. So we can compare the excitation probability on the right and the left. And if it's equal, we are in resonance because we step by the same amount of frequency right and left. That's easy to do with an acoustic optical modulator. And usually we are not. You know, then we see a difference of excitation probability and we are also at the points of maximum slope, so we get a very sensitive signal. Then we, well, correct the laser frequency and hopefully get um, an output of that laser that corresponds to the atomic frequency. Usually, of course, there are a bunch of perturbations that shift the frequency, so we have to correct these effects. 
and that's a lot of the work in making a long list of potential corrections uh, with a given uncertainty uh, how well we can correct them which gives them in the end um, the quality of the clock so which kind of transitions are we interested in in the, in the end we want to have a very narrow transition yeah, because it's easier to find the, the center of the line so we are looking for long-lived um, transitions or forbidden transitions and with long lived i would say beyond a minute it's, it's good so where do we find them in the atomic spectra well we have e1 electric dipole transitions and usually they have lifetimes of 10 nanoseconds in megahertz line but these are out there are however also intercombination lines from singlet to triplet systems in some systems where you end up with lifetimes of milliseconds which is still a little bit short but then there are, for example, these transitions here going from zero to zero states, which you uh, would say, well, they should be completely forbidden. But if you have, for example, nuclear spin, you get some level mixing here, and you end up with nice lifetimes around 160 seconds. And that's uh, what I'm, for example, working with in, in Wisconsin atoms. Um, there are, of course, other possibilities to go to higher order multiple transitions, for example, quadrupole transitions or octopole transitions even, and they have really long lifetimes, uh, are going to, to years in the end. So that's surely no limit on, on the coherence of, of any practical clock. Uh, so, and which atoms do they sh uh, show that? There are, of course, the alkaline earth atoms with the single triplet systems uh, and similar systems like the terbium, uh, a, a whole zoo of different atoms which are investigated in optical clocks which have all their advantages or disadvantages. If you ask me which is one is the best, I actually can't tell you, no? As I said, that's an open point of, of research at the moment. So I said, um, this description of, of errors, uncertainties, uh, determine the quality of the clock. So we should at least mention what are the typical qualities of the clock. And there are two factors. Uh, one is the uncertainty. That means how far co could the corrected frequency be off the true transition frequency. Uh, uh, and the other one is the instability, meaning how much scatter does an individual measurement produce? No? How far are your um, individual noisy measurements off from the, the expectation value or from the average? And there is this more or less famous cartoon illustrating these two quantities um, by, say, throwing darts at, at a target. And well, what you want is this, no? something that is stable and accurate. You always hit the right center, and you have a lot, not a lot of scatter. And if you look at a frequency time diagram, it would be a constant line with well, no, no noise on it. Um, that's still accurate, because on average, you're at the center, but you have a little bit more scatter. Um, Reproducible would be low scatter, but wrong result can be of use in, in some applications. If you have just a transfer standard, for example, to bring from one place to another. And well, that's what the real world very often is, that you get a lot of scatter and you're off. You shouldn't forget that uh, in real world, we do not know where the, the center is. Uh, uh, so that's a little bit a tricky, tricky bit to figure out if we have such a thing or this one. Yeah? So to, to make that, in, in or show this in very short sentences, instability tells you uh, how long do I have to measure to average away noise. So it's connected to statistic uncertainty, while uncertainty is how wrong my measurement could be uh, in the end. All right, so the question is, why do we go in the research field from optical, uh, from microwave transition in the cesium fountains Eckhart will speak about to optical transition? And um, I'm focusing here a little bit on the argument why we think these clocks can be way more accurate, and actually they are more accurate nowadays. So let's have a look at the two-level super-duper simple system we are speaking about. This is our reference transition. And uh, we tie the energy difference to the frequency by Planck constant, obviously. And then we have perturbations, and they usually shift around the atomic level in one or the other way. Uh, but that doesn't matter how far these two energy levels are apart, uh, the amount of how much they are shifted, usually. So you, you immediately understand that the relative influence of these shifts getting smaller the further the things are apart. So that's a simple argument why optical clocks can be more accurate than the microwave ones. Um, so you can ask yourself which perturbations do you expect? There are external fields like magnetic and 
electric fields that shift your transition. You can have collisions that change your electronic structure, the level structure. You have to trap the atoms you will see in a minute. Uh, so the trap has an influence on these levels. Uh, there's a black body radiation shift, more about that like also later. And there is um, the interrogation laser itself, no? movement of the particles, so the Doppler effect. So if you look at these things, you figure out if you increase the frequency by four orders of magnitude, roughly, uh, you get a potential gain of mostly 10 to the four everywhere, with the exception maybe of black body radiation, but still there's a decent gain here. However, the big enemy is the Doppler effect because it scales with the frequency of the transition. So there's no gain at all. Um, so what do you do about the Doppler effect? If you think about the numbers, look, uh, a thermal atom has a velocity of 100 meters per second, so you would get a Doppler shift of 10 to minus 7. If you heard people speaking about optical clocks, they say, ah, 10 to minus 18, 10 to minus 19 accuracy. Um, so that's the target. And if you have a shift that's 10 to minus 7, these are many orders of magnitude to control. So you better do some tricks to get rid of that. And of course, there are many what I call classical tricks no, developed in laser spectroscopy that you interrogate perpendicularly to the uh, velocity that you cool your atoms to centimeters per second, that you use fountain geometries, that you use standing waves and cavities to balance you know, photons from the right and the left, and therefore you know, balance the Doppler shift, stuff like that. If you do all these things, you end up with a reduction by nine orders of magnitude, which is, I would say, very impressive. So if you run the numbers, um, if you want to go to 10 to minus 18, there's still a factor of 100 missing. So the, the trick to do is get rid of the velocity, trap your particle, and quantize the motion. Um, that's one issue, and the second one is that you need equal trapping potential for both clock states. Why is it so? So first, the quantization. I mean, here the two traps, and uh, for the ground state and the excited clock state, you have the quantized motion, so you can imagine these levels are far apart in uh, far in away in an energy or in frequency, now that you get a carrier transition where you do not change the motional state in the trap, and you get sidebands by adding a vibrational quantum that you see in, in the spectrum here, for example, with the carrier and the, the sidebands. These are very different sidebands because the atoms have different di population distributions here in the trap. Uh, for example, if you get very cold and only populate the ground state, there's no red sideband because you can't go to the minus one vibrational level uh, because it doesn't exist. That's very nice. However, you want to have this transition frequency here to be the unperturbed transition frequency of the atom. Uh, so these trap potential have to be very accurately the same to keep uh, get the carrier transition at the same frequency as it would be in free space. So what are the two ideas to do that, um, to build these traps? One class very classical idea is to use a charge of the atom in an ion uh, to trap it in an oscillating electric field. Now the charge is the same no matter in which elect uh, electronic state you are in, so you get the same trapping potential. For neutrals, you do not have that handle, but there uh, you can nicely trap those things in optical dipole traps or actually in the standing wave optical lattices. And um, as the light shift is a frequen uh, frequency dependent effect, you, you can find in some species um, a frequency for your dipole trap that makes the light shift equal for the ground and the excited state, and that's what we call the magic wavelength. Uh, and if you trap the atoms at this frequency, you know, you, you, you're done your job. So these are the two approaches to trap your atom. So let's come now to the question of black body radiation and as one of the specific effects that cause frequency shifts. Um, we can describe the shift of an energy, uh, energy level uh, as a function of in the frequency of the electromagnetic wave with which it's interacting by this equation, which is in the end a sum over different contributions from atomic resonances. So you have a matrix element here um, for the coupling between the electromagnetic wave and the atomic transition, uh, and then there is a resonance denominator, etc. And if you look at that here in the example of strontium on the frequency scale, 
uh, you see for the ground state of the clock transition, which is the singlet at zero state, uh, that's mostly flat, and you get the first resonance somewhere at 460 nanometers. And if you go to the excited state, the triplet state, the triplet to zero state, there's already a resonance at 2.6 micron. And that's coming out of no, this, this sum here. Now, um, if you look at that graph, you see that at low frequencies, where most of the black body spectrum is located, these curves are very flat. Oh, that's, that's good because it means the description should be easy. And you also realize that the higher the first resonance is, the smaller the polarizability here uh, is here uh, within the black body spectrum overlap. So that brings you to the um, idea that, well, you can describe the interaction between black body radiation and the polarizabilities or polarizability differences of the atoms, mostly by the static polarizability, meaning uh, no, the uh, limit of zero frequency here, because it's mostly flat. And, well, if you have only high frequency transitions, the effect is supposed to be smaller. So that already tells you that typically the shift is smaller in, in ions because you have high frequency transitions only no, than in neutral atoms. So um, do we care about this black body shift? No, I mean, you can do the, the math um, and you come up, yes, you do care, but you can also look at your experiment and wonder if this is of interest. For example, if you think about the ions, as I said, well, the polarizability difference delta alpha is small, but then, well, you may have hot surfaces around no, because the ion trap has to come close to the atom no, to produce the electric field. And you have an oscillating electric field of high voltage, several hundred volts, and it usually ends up with heating insulators here. And you see this in the infrared image that there can be hot spots, no, which make life or can make life more difficult no, because you had inhomogeneous and hot um, surfaces around. On the neutral atom side with the optical lattice, that's quite nice because you can bring the atoms far away from any surfaces within the middle of a vacuum chamber. However, um, in, in many of the systems, we have low frequency transitions in the triplet system. You saw the 2.6 micron transition in the graph before. And that means that we get a, a large polarizability and that's harmful, especially harmful in the atom strontium I'm, I'm working with. So, as I said, yes, we do care if you look at 10 to minus 18 clock accuracy because these shifts can be as large as 10 to minus 15. So, again, three orders of magnitude to control. So, how do we do that? Um, I showed you that uh, equation before, and we had on the first day a little bit of discussion uh, on static and dynamic polarizability, and I tried to motivate that here. You, you, as I said, um, you say mostly that's flat, no, um, these curves, the frequency dependence. So you try to split off um, a contribution that goes with the excitation value of the electric field squared times the static polarizability to describe the largest part of the effect. And that's what we call static polarizability because it's connected to the polarizability at zero frequency. However, you see there's a little bit of curvature here, so there must be some residual, some reminder, and that's what we add up in the dynamical polarizability. If you take that sum here, uh, you can do some algebra and well, define the static polarizability for an individual state by this sum here and the dynamic contribution by this well, lengthy sum. So there is no problem of um, approximation in this case. That's just something you can write down in a different fashion. So no Taylor expansion, no nothing. However, um, this equation here uh, involves this G function, which is in the end an integral that represents the black body radiation integrated over this resonance structure. And that one is a little bit nasty because you have to integrate around uh, over this, you know, this poles here. And, and actually in that case, very often, uh, some Taylor approximation is, is used. Uh, and indeed, you have to be careful here with convergence because if you expand that in a Taylor series, you can show that the convergence radio, uh, radius of this Taylor series is strictly zero. Um, and it works surprisingly well, mostly, but if you are at low 
frequency transitions and you get an overlap actually doesn't work at all. And you can make considerable errors if you use not the numerical integration of the integral, but this Taylor expansion. All right, so um, how do we approach this now experimentally? We have to get the static polarizability difference, which describes most of the effect. For some of the atoms, we need precise knowledge of this dynamic correction on top. And we have to ask ourselves, how large is the actual temperature? So um, I showed you the equations. We can calculate things. You know, we have a spectroscopic knowledge of the transition frequencies of the A coefficients. Here we go. Very often, this result for the polarizability is not accurate enough uh, because while there are uncertainties on the lifetimes in the order of percent or 10%, uh, and we have to contributions from the continuum or core polarizabilities, all that stuff that add up, um, and it's not trivial to do the math there correctly. So it's better to get an experimental value in very many cases, and there are different approaches. For example, if you go for the ions, you already have your electric field ready available. That's what you trap your atoms with. But usually you're setting in the settle point of this potential, so there is no RMS field. But you can displace the ion um, uh, to some points where you see more of the oscillating field, and you can observe the frequency shift. And indeed, well, you see this quadratic dependence you expect for the dark effect um, there. And from that, you can, in principle, say I can derive the polarizability, which is kind of the, the opening slope of this parabola. Or however, you have to know the electric field uh, of your trapped potential, uh, which is something you do not necessarily know very accurately. And um, also, this displacement of the ion produces a higher motion, uh, a wriggling in this oscillating field, which you call micro motion, and then in itself is connected to a second order Doppler effect, which is an also something that shows a safe functional dependence, but that's not what you want to measure. So you have to disentangle these two effects, which, well, is a problem, but you can do. That's one approach to get delta alpha. Um, you can use these value. You know, here there's a, a number for, for terbium, and um, refine that value by illuminating the atom with a laser beam from uh, of which you know the intensity. And that's the critical point. You can very nicely measure the, the power of a laser beam by setting their power meter, but then you, ha you need the intensity profile uh, to get the real intensity. And there are speckle patterns, dust, uh, distortions, any kind of, of nasty things. So to come from power to intensity is a tricky bit. So that's what the colleagues here at PTD did, is make a very careful map of the intensity profile of the laser uh, to figure out what kind of mode they have, so what kind of irregularities. And then they did this at different wavelengths and well, mapped out you know, these points here. They know the dynamic part, this curvature, well enough uh, that you can provide a much better value for the polarizability difference in the end. And um, if you do that, you, you end up with uh, something like 2% accuracy on the differential static polarizability, uh, which is a nice value for, for this quantity. And if you run the numbers, that's good enough to produce a 10 to minus 18 correction at 300 Kelvin, meaning room temperature clock. There are other ways uh, to come to that polarizability difference uh, in, in ions. If you have the interesting case um, that the static polarizability difference is smaller than zero, because then um, actually the second order Doppler effect uh, by the micro motion and the Stark effect do not add up but compensate each other. And uh, you can find a expression um, that in first order tells you that you find a frequency, you can determine, and it's dependent on the trap drive frequency, I should say, uh, and at a special frequency, these two things cancel. And this frequency can be shown uh, is independent on the electric field of the trap. So you do not have to know what field you have at, a po uh, at that point, you just have to measure frequency shift. And that's what clocks are made for. Uh, so you need a reference uh, clock at which you compare, you change your 
your, your trap drive frequency, you observe the frequency shift, you think you know what the right frequency is, and at that frequency you say, look, I read out this trap frequency, I take these equations, and here I have my delta alpha. But actually things are, of course, a little bit more tedious because first order approximation is not always sufficient. You need some higher order corrections, et cetera, et cetera. But the main trick is that you cancel these two effects to a high degree. If you do that, uh, you can determine the, the static polarizer, the immobility difference by roughly an order of magnitude better, uh, as it was demonstrated for the strontium ion. Um, so again, uh, mission accomplished, 10 to, 10 to minus 80 is, in, is within in reach from the atomic side. So that's what I wanted to say for the, for the ions. Um, if we swap now to the neutrals, things are getting a little bit more difficult because we need delta alpha much more accurately because of this higher polarizability and the low lying transition. And um, well, that was my introductory picture from our lab where we see this fork structure here, which is a capacitor into which we move these blue fluorescing atoms to probe them. So we apply, again, a well-known electric field uh, in this capacitor and see how the atom um, reacts to that. We did that for strontium, and similar experiments have been done at, at NIST in the US for, for the terbium neutral lattice clocks. So I'm showing here our results. Um, that's what, what we did. You know, we have applied voltage on the capacitor plates and the observed frequency shifts, you see you have get kilohertz shifts, no? and it looks parabolic, you have a fit. If you look at the residuals, they are really small, I would say. I mean, uh, at the 60 kilohertz shift, we see residuals which are smaller than a hertz. Um, so that's a really nice parabola, I would say. Uh, it's very consistent, it's quite cool, and you already see 10 to minus 5 resolution seems to be possible. Of course, um, you need your electric field. No, you can measure the voltage nicely, there are voltmeters calibrated that do the job, but you need the plate separation. And if you want to match this resolution, you have to know the plate separation better than 10 to minus 5, which is for typical separations of half a millimeter, uh, half a centimeter, you, you have in real life in the order of a few 10 nanometers. So that was a major task to, to determine these capacitor separations to tens of nanometers, but if you have colleagues at the Metrology Institute who know how to do that, um, that's facilitated quite, quite a bit. So it helped both the colleagues at, at NIST as well as us to, to get the separation. So in the end, we can do it, and we come up with uh, polarizability differences that are accurate to two times 10 to minus five, which brings us at room temperature to 10 to minus 80. So everybody does his job just as, as nicely as we have to do it. So we know delta alpha, but we don't know the dynamic correction yet. Uh, and um, especially for the, the neutrals, strontium and terbium, it's mostly determined by this first resonance here. No, that determines the, the curvature here. And it's a resonance in the triplet system at a few micrometers. And we didn't know the lifetime accurately enough. So dedicated measurements were, were done in, in, in at GILAR and uh, as well as at, at NIST. To, to measure that lifetimes to 10 to minus three-ish level, which is also not trivial to do these lifetime measurements because you have other effects like black body pumping and overlapping and you know, decay channels uh, to, to the ground state, which you have to separate from the actual decay channel you want to look at, et cetera. And that provides already the, the most important contribution in this sum over all transitions uh, to the dynamic correction. So um, I think you can do a little bit better, um, or you can use more information, I should say. No, you surely need that oscillator, but we know more uh, about the atom. We know many of the lifetimes with moderately, uh, moderate accuracy, but we, all, for example, also know at which frequency the polarizabilities of the two clock states are the same, because that's exactly the trapping frequency of our magic wavelength lattice. No, that's the so that's something we measure. Um, so we know, for example, this crossing point. And there are a number of other measurements for tune-out frequencies where we know which, how polarizabilities behave, etc. So we can plug all these numbers into a code 
uh, along with the lifetimes of, of the atoms, the transition frequencies, and try to have a global description of this thing. Uh, in the end, it should work. Uh, that tells us how consistent our data is. Of course, we also have the polarizability difference here. We have some static polarizability of, of the ground state uh, from photocessation measurements, stuff like that is available. If you do that, um, at least I got very unhappy because it's very difficult, or I should say next to impossible, to get a consistent picture um, of all these, these data points. They scatter much more than one sigma. Meaning that either this model is incomplete, and yes, there could be higher uh, order you know, contributions from an X dipole or so, but if you make um, well, estimations, that's not the problem. Uh, uh, no, so it's probably more the case that some of the numbers are not as accurate as they claim to be. Well, that's happening. So in the end, uh, but that limits the knowledge of the system you have, no? and that must reflect also in the dynamic correction, no? that you do not know your system perfectly. Um, so that's where we are. We, I think we can describe this contribution for the neutrals at a level that's sufficient for 10 to minus 18, um, but you have to be careful with the number itself. You have to be careful how that dynamic correction changes with temperature, no, because the overlap with the black body spectrum no, moves, uh, it's not only scaling with the power of the black body field, but also no, the uh, overlap, especially with this transition here, no, is, is changing. Um, you have to be careful if you do the calculations how this integral is approximated or not. So we recently um, realized that there was well uh, a small error or mismatch which caused a mid 10 to minus 18 inaccuracy in the calculation, stuff like that. So in the end, I think this is the limit where we are and I also believe it can be quite tricky to improve that or lower that limit. Um, so that's the part of the atom, but now we need the field. And so far I was speaking about black body radiation field. Um, of course, we have a vacuum chamber with different parts, different temperatures, so it's not a perfect but, uh, no black body field. But we, we need that to represent the calculations in the end. So the question is, how do we handle that? No, there are temperature gradients, there are different emissivities of different parts, etc. And there are many different approaches uh, appropriate for the accuracy re you require no, to, to describe your black body shift. One is, of course, to do very detailed simulation of the temperature distribution of the materials uh, to see what is the representative field at the position of the atom here and in, in, in actually there in the trap. You can say, look, let's put a probe at the place where the atoms are. That's what the people at Villa did. You have some sensor, you move it in here where the atoms are supposed to be, you measure the radiation, the power of the black body radiation and say that's a measure um, for, for your no, temperature. Of course, you have to be a little bit careful with the spectral distribution if you would have some spikes or so, but that's the that's way to, to go. Um, or you, and that's well, what I personally like, is here an example from NIST for the terbium group, you make your temperature homogeneous as possible. No, no gradients, as close as possible, the environment helps you to have, no matter what emissivity you have, a black body field inside. Of course, um, you have to get your atoms in, and as we load from atomic beams, you want to get your atoms out at some point as well. Um, so there are holes in, and holes mean that external radiation couples and so again something to be careful about. So if you look at these approaches, they very often limit you at in, in many cases at the 10 to minus 17 to a 10 to minus 18 level. Some uh, atoms are a little bit better, but that's where we are at the room temperature. Um, so that's why one obvious approach is to reduce the environmental temperature especially for neutral atoms. Uh, if you get rid of the black body radiation, you don't care any longer if you know it well or not. That's a little bit illustrated in this graph here, where we see down here the temperature, uh, 300 Kelvin is down here, that's 100 Kelvin, and the fractional black body uncertainty, 10 to minus 17, 10 to minus 18, 10 to minus 19 here. This black line here represents the 
uncertainty we can achieve due to the knowledge of the atomic response to the black body radiation. So at the moment we won't get below that. But this is falling off very rapidly if you lower the temperature, as you see. And you also see at room temperature, we are around 10 to minus 18 with strontium. On top of that, you have to describe your black body field. And you could say that um, the knowledge about that is represented by an uncertainty of the temperature. You, know, you give temperature gradients, etc. So you see, if you want to get 10 to minus 18 at room temperature, you have to get temperature measurements at the level of 10 mi uh, millikelvin or so. And if you have ever measured m temperatures, um, that's a pretty nasty job to get something right on that level, calibration-wise as well as stability-wise, etc. Um, however, things get much better if you go to low temperature. Uh, for example, the group uh, in Japan from Hitoshi Katori built um, a lattice clock where they have their lattice in a ring cavity, and um, by producing or using different frequencies. You know, they can move, have a running wave here in, in, in the lattice and move the atoms from their loading region here into some um, environment, enclosed environment with two very small holes. And you can lower the f uh, temperature of that black body shield to something like 100 Kelvin if you want to. So you're down here. You see, look, at for 10 to minus 18, no, what was 10 millikelvin before is now 300, 400 millikelvin. It's super duper easy to, to handle that. Uh, and no, it opens up the door to 10 to minus 19 because the atomic response is so well known. And no, so making things cold just really helps. Um, we follow a PTB, actually we, we build up a, a similar experiment as well, but we also have another one here where we say, look, this transport of atoms uh, something we would like to get rid of. Uh, again, mo moving atoms, Doppler effect is ooh, a nasty thing. Um, so what we build is a copper environment, uh, similar to the NIST one I, I showed you before, uh, which has a double shielding. Of course, there should be lids on, on, on top of here, no, um, just in this drawing uh, to see what's inside. Um, no, we, we left them off. Um, we have a double shielding here because now most of the environmental black body radiation is absorbed by the outer shield, so you get a more homogeneous uh, no distribution on the inner shield, and that's especially true for, for the windows uh, no, because we have to shine in laser beams for laser cooling, for detecting, for interrogation, etc. And, well, windows absorb a lot of black body radiation, which is good because we don't want the black body radiation to get in, but that also means because they are not very thermally conductive, they get warm. Uh, so that's not good because your temperature wouldn't be homogeneous. So we have this double layer windows here to have homogeneous temperatures on the inside. Um, so that's working quite nicely. Um, here, you, you see a plot when we measured the frequency of that clock as a function of time by comparison actually against the turbium clock, uh, uh, the iron clock. And um, there's a red curve which shows the represented te temperature of this inner enclosure. You see at first it increases to some extent because we were cold before and switched off the cooler. So it increases in temperature and you see the frequency of the clock where we correct it for all effects but the black body radiation shift, no, decrease. And then at some point we turn on the cooler again, the temperature goes down from 20 to, what is it, minus 60 degrees here on that plot, and the frequency of the clock no, goes up. So the black body shift really disappears. And the, the, uh, the blue line is the expected shift from, from our knowledge of the coefficient. And of course on that scale, uh, with this noise, it fits perfectly. No, that's what you expect, but you also see the shift is pretty large no? already on this temperature change of uh, 50, 60, 70 degrees centigrade. You get more than a hertz of frequency shift, which is enormous uh, for us. So it really is there um, and or it gets smaller if you get cold. So we have to be aware of holes in windows. Uh, no, there are open holes to get the atoms in and outside black body radiation comes in. So we will put in, in this apparatus here some shutters uh, to get rid of those uh, radiation parts. And for the experiment uh, I showed you before from Katori where the 
uh, move the atoms into the smaller enclosure. Well, you better drill your holes really carefully that you know how large they are. So we did a similar thing recently for uh, transportable clock at PTB. These holes have a diameter of a millimeter, and we think we know the dimensions within 10 micrometers. You know? So you know the solid angle quite well and can correct for these effects. A little bit more or less obvious, we found our, our windows. Uh, no, because we all know windows are transparent. That's why they're pretty cool in buildings. Um, and we also know that we can have mobile phone reception behind windows. So there is some um, terahertz or you know, low frequency transmission. So if you look at glasses, and you do not find necessarily transmission uh, values. So we asked colleagues at PTB again to measure that for us, which is nice. So they gave us this uh, uh, transmission curve, and then we folded that with the black body curve, which goes off the scale here and comes back down here. You see that you have a bit of transmission uh, at low frequencies, and you get, uh, again, at high frequencies transmission at micrometers. And that uh, depends quite a bit on the type of glass you're using. And if you use good glass, like fused silica, that gets much worse because you get more transmission in the terahertz range and, and invisible. Uh, so you better take EK7, uh, cheap things, uh, to get a lot of absorption. Uh, and so if you want to make sure that this residual transmission here from the room temperature stuff through the windows doesn't bother you too much, and with bothering too much, I meant that it should be cause a fractional frequency shift of, of below 10 to minus 19, that you do not really have to care for it uh, in reflectivity, etc. You better take a centimeter of glass here. That's why we have two times five millimeters to, to really bring the absorption down far enough. Uh, so it's not so small effect, no, if we are honest. So one has to be, as I said, a little bit careful there. All right. Um, one side note, you, we plug in thermometers, no, PT100 sensors, for example, uh, to measure temperatures, and we get them calibrated from company, and that's good. Uh, they give us uncertainty for the temperature calibration. However, the reading of the temperature uh, sensor is not what we're actually interested in, uh, unfortunately, because these readings are given in the international temperature scale, the ITS90. Um, which is a conventional scale calibrated to fixed points you know, by melting of gallium or to, or to a point of water is, of course, correct. Um, but what, what we want is a thermodynamic temperature that represents the radiation field. And these are not the same. Uh, and you should ask yourself, how, how much are they not the same? And that's, a, well, actually a subject of, of research. And for people after the redefinition of the no, SI system recently with the definition of fixing of KB, etc., where they looked at the temperature range here from 0 to 350 Kelvin uh, in this publication here, and look for, for differences between ITS 90, the representation we use for calibration of thermometers, and the thermodynamic temperature scale. And, well, things match, of course, perfectly at the triple point of water, which is a fixed point here, uh, but then it deviates, well, if it's a lot or not, you can, depends on with which system you're working. Uh, for example, if you look at 300 Kelvin, you are off by a few millikelvin already. And a few millikelvin, if you, you know, look at the uh, numbers I told you before, measuring temperatures of 10 millikelvin is not, no longer negligible. Um, no, so in the end, you, know, you want to be careful. Um, if you're working with these systems. So that brings me to, to the end. Um, I, I spoke about different ways to, to determine static polarizability difference that can be done you know, with pretty high accuracy. Uh, in, for some of the atoms, especially the neutrals, you have to take care of the atomic structure, you know, which reflects itself in the dynamic correction. Um, so it's deviation from a flat response uh, to, to black body radiation. Well, you have to make your environment very homogeneous that you find the representative temperature uh, that describes your, your field properly. And uh, good thermal management is, is a highly important point uh, in, in any kind of, of clock nowadays, that you do not run into difficulties, even though you may have a small polarizability difference. 
Okay, thank you very much for attention and maybe you have questions.